The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, are there any people who would self-describe themselves as licensed geeks? Awesome. Um, so uh, this is a small, relatively intimate crowd, so feel free to make this a conversation. No one wants to hear me rattle on for an hour. Um, my name is David Nally. Uh, my contact information is there. Um, uh, I currently work on and am paid to work on a project called Apache Cloud Stack, which is a infrastructure as a service cloud platform. Um, and one of the reasons that, uh, that I pitched this talk is that we may recently made the jump from GPL to ASL, which is a copy left to a permissive license. Um, I'm also a contributor to the Fedora project and do a number of things there. Uh, I'm a recovering sysadmin that probably doesn't mean anything here. And uh, I am a maker of ugly slides. There's nothing that you will see from my slides that is aesthetically pleasing. So um, I will apologize and that. So, so let's start out with, with why we bother with licensing at all. And, and I think that there's a a deep history of both pride. Uh, I think that um, particularly when we essentially have an economy of plenty for most of the people who are writing open source code that uh, the pride in their work and uh, the, the credibility that they get from creating things uh, stops some people from just saying do whatever you want with it. There's also uh, you know some some particularly thorny issues once you escape the United States with public domain. And so public domain is not enough, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why it's not enough in a bit. So for those of you who aren't uh, uh, licensing geeks, and I'm sure there are, uh, there are a few here, copyleft, uh, which typically, the, the prime example there is the GPL. Um, it says, and of course not verbatim, but it says that users are free to do whatever they wish. They can use it in any manner they want. Uh, developers are free to do whatever they wish with the code as well. They can go and hack on it, they can change it, they can modify it. Um, distributors, however, and a distributor is someone who hands out the software, whether physically or electronically. Uh, any changes that they make under, if it's under a copyleft license, those must be available to the people that they distribute that to. Most of the time, most people uh, in practice make those changes available to everyone. Um, any confusion about copyleft so far? All right, so let's talk about permissive licensing. Um, generally speaking, and the caveat will come in just a minute, but generally speaking, Users are also free to do whatever they wish. Developers are free to do whatever they wish. Distributors are free to do whatever they wish, up to and including typically um, sub-licensing or re-licensing the code. Uh, the caveat here is that you typically have to at least preserve, uh, preserve attribution. Uh, you also may have um, uh, some of the Permissive licensing also require you to, if you're changing it, that you also change the name, unless you have permission to not do so. Anyone confused about permissive licensing? Tell me what your confusion is. Yes, they they do not have to pass on changes. They can actually make changes, keep them completely proprietary, sell your your open source project as a uh, proprietarily licensed fork effectively and never contribute back. And now we had just had another licensed geek who used to work for the FSF walk in. Um, so I, I feel like I am doing a poor job with this uh, presentation now because there are tons of licensed geeks and the FSF in the house. So in, in the old days, Permissive behavior was the default. 
Uh, there weren't really licenses because people were selling you the hardware and the software was just something that came along with it. And you, by definition, you received the source code with it. Uh, and many times it was, uh, it was gonna be an assembler anyway. And so you would, you would receive the source code that came along with it. And this changed when Xerox decided to piss off a, a free software hippie who didn't know he was a free software hippie yet. Um, in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so Richard Stallman uh, was living quite happily in the AI lab at MIT, and uh, they continually had problems with printer jams, and he wanted to rewrite a driver, and he asked Xerox for it. And Xerox said, well, that's proprietary. We can't share that with you. And uh, he seems to list this as his defining moment when, when uh, you know, the, the uh, seas, clouds parted and he was able to, to actually look and see, hey, there's a problem and I need to, to make a, um, an effort at fixing this. And so one of his software projects was the first to bear uh, a GPL license and he has led the FSF and uh, led a lot of the licensing debates, particularly around free software. Um, so Xerox uh, essentially uh, started the copy left movement um, basically by pissing people off. So, um, so <clears throat> Xerox didn't want to play nice and let people fix their problems and, um, and RMS felt the need to protect uh, against the, R the Xerox types of the world. And uh, if, uh, if you read some of his writings, he talks about the diminishing hacker ethic at the AI labs, and uh, and he was essentially trying to force that type of uh, of sharing ethic back um, into uh, into the software world. So the GPL is great. It it requires people to essentially share alike. Uh, there's a content license by Creative Commons that I think uh, colloquially puts it as um, you tell people who did it and, and you share your changes just like the original was shared with you. Uh, and they call that uh, CC by share alike. But uh, we continued to move, move along and as technology changed, a lot of the original terms of the GPL uh, simply became outdated. And, and uh, GPL2 has been with us for quite a long time. Um, we've had, um, We've had a number of things that have really crept up and started creating problems uh, since GPL v2. Uh, the biggest one is software patents. Um, and so both permissive licenses now, uh, the, uh, the Apache software license and the GPL have patent sections now uh, to deal with that. Um, we also ran into a problem where really smart people were taking open source software and they were making billions off of it uh, by leveraging that plus a little bit of their own code. And under the traditional source type of, uh, of open source license, they weren't required to release their code even if it interacted because they were never distributing it. Um, and so I call this the, um, the acification of uh, software. So it's made as a service and um, when it's made as a service, uh, it, uh, it all sits on one vendor's hardware and uh, the, the end user's interacting with it but never actually possesses the software. So there's no need, even if you're using GPL software and start making changes, you're not distributing so you're not triggering the clause that requires you to, to change that uh, or to distribute your changes. And then we have uh, TiVoization and TiVoization essentially uh, TiVo, uh, anyone here not know who TiVo is? It's now out of, out of uh, pop culture, but I don't know how far it's out of pop culture. TiVo essentially wouldn't allow you, even though they were, uh, they were publishing what changes they were making, their hardware would not allow you to make changes uh, and still run that, that modified code on their hardware. Um, and so, these are an example of things that, that started happening that were noticed by the free software community 
and the open source community for that matter. Um, and, and people started effectively with GPLv3 addressing these and, and to a lesser degree with some of the other licenses. Does anyone not know the difference between free software and open source? Okay, good. I, don't have I wasn't gonna tell you what it was anyway. I'd make someone else do it. But. So. <laughs> Yes, we can do that as a BOF, right? Um, so, so I've had some, I have generally speaking been on the side of a uh, free software or open source developer. Um, and so my, uh, my perspective was always typically that the GPL is awesome. You know, not least of which is because there are people who are smarter than I am who are using the software and I want to benefit from their changes. Um, but uh, individuals and certainly um, free and open source software developers do not the world make. And uh, companies make a lot of decisions about what software is used. And generally speaking, uh, especially with licensing, um, lawyers make a lot of those policy decisions about what licenses you should have. Um, if, if you've been around for any length of time, you'll remember that Linux used to scare people. People used to say if you use Linux, you'll have to give all of your code uh, to the internet because um, it's viral and it's infectious and uh, you can't let any of it get in, involved in any of your enterprise. Um, and there was lots of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that was going around. Much of that still exists today. Um, I still see on, uh, on mailing lists people that say, I cannot use the MySQL database because any data that I put in the MySQL database, I have to share because that's the terms of the GPL. Um, and, and it literally scares people to death that, um, that they have to. And, and while I'm not necessarily advocating for MySQL, um, that's quite honestly absurd. Um, and, and it doesn't help that that is still proclaimed by a lot of people who, who ironically claim to be license geeks. So if you think that the GPL requires you to share uh, data that are programs that you change, um, let's correct that now. And, and essentially, if you, if you distribute software, uh, if you take, for instance, MySQL and you change how MySQL handles your data, um, and you're modifying that particular code, and you distribute it as something like MariaDB, yes, you must share your changes. If that's not the case, then you probably do not have to share your changes. Um, if you're keeping that all in-house and you want to muck around with how MySQL deals with your data because you're smarter about it than Oracle is now, um, feel, feel free to keep those changes to yourself. There's no legal obligation there. The GPL v3 still scares a lot of lawyers, especially corporate lawyers who are not free software lawyers. Um, I had a conversation with the with a CTO in a Fortune 500 technology company who incidentally sells lots of products based on open source. Um, and GPL v3 uh, was completely off limits. Um, there are, there are companies that employ tens of kernel developers who actively commit to the Linux kernel, whose lawyers say, thou shalt not bring any GPL v3 software into this enterprise, period. No, no, you can go get permission from someone else. It is completely off, off bounds. A lot of that is, is FUD. Um, a lot of that is uh, people reading the patent section of the GPL v3 and are absolutely terrified. Um, and, uh, and honestly, I, I'm actually surprised. I, I thought that we had gotten past a lot of those issues with GPL v2, uh, but people are absolutely, the, the new scare, it used to be that if you allow GPL software in, all of your other software will become infected and you will have to share it. Now it's if you allow the GPL in, all of your patents will become infected and you must essentially license the patents to the world. 
And so if you are a technology company, particularly a technology company with a patent portfolio, um, this shouldn't scare you because you shouldn't be patenting software in the first place, but um, uh, this, this absolutely terrifies people. So um, causing a lot of problems. There are some, I talked about uh, in this arms race, the assification of, of uh, free software. Uh, there's a special type of GPL license called the Afero GPL that says if you provide a public offering based upon software that's licensed under the Afero GPL, you must share your, your changes as well. Um, I will tell you that that scares sysadmins because they think, oh, I did a hot fix to that application. How soon do I have to publish it? Um, what is the record keeping requirements around that? I did something and it wasn't, it was in production for a week and now I've ripped it out and replaced it with something else. Do I have to keep that around for n number of years? Um, so lots of, uh, there's honestly lots of fear and I, as a free software developer, I never saw any of those fears until I got on the other side of that where I was talking to people in corporate departments who were trying to deploy software I was writing. And so I see the fear now. Um, and so from a free software perspective, this is where I was making my, my choices. I was saying, you know, do I fear a competitor or forks uh, of a project? Because I can effectively, I can't stop a fork, but I can at least force a fork to share changes that I can also benefit from. Um, do I want my software to become a standard? Because uh, software that is considered a standard tends to be very liberally licensed. Uh, you can evidence that with uh, Apache and uh, the Apache uh, web server uh, and some of the other, some of the other um, uh, pervasively uh, distributed pieces of software. And as soon as I say that, people go, yeah, but the Linux kernel is GPL'd and the de facto standard for file sharing is Samba. Um, but typically people find it easier to make something a standard if, it's, uh, if it is permissively licensed because there is less fear around it, uh, fear around adoption. Or at least that's been my experience. Um, the other is do you want to enforce freedom? Uh, ideologically, I like the idea of saying, yes, you can, you can uh, take my code and do anything you want with it and please help improve it and if you improve it, make sure you share your, your changes back. Um, a lot of people take that very wrongly and I, I don't mean it to, to come off as uh, you must share with me, but uh, it is a, it does provide a, um, a true society where uh, if you benefit from something I do, I should uh, also benefit from the improvements that you make from it. And so that's my ideological, my personal ideological belief. Uh, for most, for most things, I tend to be copy left leaning. So now I'm going to talk about some of the experiences that I didn't want to put in slides. So I just, uh, I work on, as I mentioned, I work on CloudStack. Um, we've had for in excess of a year, uh, we have. Uh, been essentially debating this copyleft versus permissive licensing issue uh, internally, and I'm going to sit down because this should be a conversation, not me preaching at you. Um, and in the course of that conversation, we've we've had everything from fear of forks, uh, the uh, a number of people saying we don't even look at you because of GPL v3, um, and we don't think that uh, we don't think that. Uh, you, um, we don't think that that license will work for us corporately, and thus we're also not will. In addition to not adopting, we're not willing to contribute. Um, oh. I personally was very opposed to CloudStack's move to the Apache license because I have certain ideological beliefs, um, and at the same time, I can say that uh, I have been shocked at the number of people who have stepped up and said, hey, now that you've got a license that we can work with, uh, 
and, and also I think there were some governance issues around there. Now that you've got both a license and a governance that we can work with, we are happy to contribute, um, which has really been shocking because I, I felt like I was saying, this is going to be bad, this is going to be bad. We made the switch and now it's, all of this is good, all of this is good. Was I crying wolf? Um, and uh, and it, was, it was a very interesting uh, move. Uh, there's only, uh, I think there's only a, no, one other project that's made that recently of any scale, and that's been Puppet. And Puppet moved from GPL to Apache as well. Um, and, and they said, you know, in the end, we want everybody in the world to work with us. We don't care if they are uh, contributing back or not. We're going to continue doing what we're doing. If they choose to for effectively fork or, or actually fork and create another project, that's one more person that is at least thinking the way that we think, if not uh, actually adopting everything that we're doing uh, in the long run. Um, it's an interesting thing. Anyone have thoughts? You guys have been silent and just let me rant. Yeah. Yes. So, so, interestingly enough, uh, the so to give you a brief background on Open Office. Open Office used to be an independent company that was building Star Office. They were acquired by Sun. Sun continued selling Star Office, but made effectively the identical same thing available as Open Office, and that was LGPL. Yeah, I, I think originally it was LGPL, so it was one of the weaker copyleft licenses. Right, you're not you're not mo you, you're not modifying the core, so you don't have to distribute changes, um, and so. Um, there was, uh, uh, Oracle had it, um, essentially there was a fork because Oracle was not responsive enough or non-responsive. Um, and uh, Oracle then went and said, hey, what do you guys want to do? There are people who are running commercial distributions like IBM. Uh, and IBM said, yeah, we would like for you to continue supporting that and, and continue moving forward. And they said, well, you know, we aren't really in the, uh, we're not really in the um, software suite business. And they turned it over to the Apache Software Foundation after the fork had occurred. And they had lost all of their, uh, a lot of their mind share from the free software community. Um, IBM has since contributed Symphony, all of the Symphony stuff back into the code, which I think has been a positive thing, uh, but I think it's also, IBM realizes that if they're going to continue deploying Symphony, they have to be a part of that solution because Oracle has effectively abandoned it. Yeah. Yeah, or at least the paid developers, yeah. Yeah. There, there's supposedly 60 people uh, on their committer project management committee list right now. Yeah, yeah, it, it's a small number, but uh, it's not, it's certainly not just IBM. So, um, you know, what that, whether that's a, is that a failure of weak copy left or is that a failure of Oracle or is that a, is that completely irrelevant to licensing? I don't know, but I think yeah, you, you were going. You were going that you didn't trust it essentially because they had forked it and were doing things that you couldn't see. Sure. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. But per 
permissive licensing allows that to happen if someone takes the permissively licensed software. You, you can still, while you can with a permissively licensed um, uh, project, you can release a binary and never release the source. In practice, permissively licensed projects tend to release their source at the same time. And so, yes, you can get away from the, um, yeah. Sure, from, from, the, from the people who are doing it. Yes. 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 Yeah. But the question. But Russell's a freedom hater because he uses the iPhone anyway, so he doesn't care about preserving freedom. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, Because when you incorporate pieces of copyleft software, then you also have to share. So um, there was some sort of disingenuous study. I know not use that word exactly. Um, uh, earlier this year saying that uh, GPL use had declined. And then uh, John Sullivan from the Free Software Foundation looked into that. And it's not the case. The percentage of GPL use compared to other licenses has declined. But the overall growth of free software continues to grow both permissive license stuff and copyleft license stuff. Right. So it's, um, so the, the personal decision, like, you know, you can root your phone or you can, you know, suck it up, or if your office buys you an iPhone and you like having free, as in cost stuff, then or whatever. But the, for me, the larger issue is like, as a community, uh, what do we want to do? Do we want to license in a mm. way that's intentional for the overall growth of the community? And I think copyleft is the way to go. So, that's so ideologically, I tend to agree. I, I have, I tend to think though, that I've been, that my um, ideology is not necessarily misguided, but occasionally doesn't work out the way that I think it would, should. Um, specifically because we're making kind of the assumption that, uh, that people will continue to develop regardless of the license change. And I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that, and I say this because that's, that's the result I've seen with CloudStack. If CloudStack had had the large number of people from from places like GoDaddy and SunGuard, who
who had been hacking on our GPL code, we probably would not have made the move to the Apache license. And yet that has been one of the effects is that, uh, yes, people can now take and close our source back up, but there are also more people who are working on, on, building, um, on building open source software now that it's Apache licensed than they were when it was GPL'd. So, yeah, you know, it, it also, it kind of, it makes me wonder again, like how corporate attorneys get paid so much when it's, I don't, I don't think that the version three of the GPL is that hard to parse and I'm not an attorney, but, and it's not that long. It's longer than V2, but it's, I mean, you know, at law school, you have to do a lot of reading, I, I hear. And so I, I just, I wonder where these folks are earning their keep because if, you know, if someone wants to pay me to sit around for hours and hours and not read stuff that pertains to my job, then, you know, well, I'd probably do something else there, but. I, 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 I cannot. The momentum towards a lot of lawyers and, and industries trying to push IP, as, you know, um, intellectual property as a law and trying to lump copyright and patents together. And so now when they, as soon as they see a pushback through GPL v3, then they're kind of like, whoa, wait a second, what are we doing? You know, what's happening here? You know, and so it's kind of like this kind of a double-edged sword on that. Absolutely, I agree. It's a much bigger risk. It, it's so where they can be more comfortable taking a risk on copyright license that open source training don't understand, they're a lot less willing to go in that direction with patents. They want something that looks like everything other patent is the same thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah literally said we cannot even consider your software uh, because it's GPL v3. And, and it was absolutely eye-opening to me because the person who told me that was, uh, was a frequent contributor to open source and he said our legal department simply will not have it. We Did ship... Did they mention the patent clause specifically? Yes, they mentioned the patent clause okay. specifically. And they specifically cited that they felt that the patent clause was viral in GPL. And to the point that they said that they were afraid to even use GPL v3 software. And I'm like, so you mean you don't use Samba? And they're like, well, we use an old version of Samba. I'm like, okay. Um, so I don't, I don't know that that, uh, uh, the, the patent stuff really scares people. I don't know that, um, yeah. Maybe the TiVo stuff scares some hardware manufacturers, but uh, I think the uh, I think the patent stuff is is really absolutely frightening. And lawyers, well, you know, lawyers are typically a paid to to evaluate risk, right? And if it's a ri an unknown risk, they tend to go, "Oh no, thou shalt not do this," rather than saying, "You have X." percent uh, x percentage of being sued for doing this well I'm, I'm kind of curious then did these companies when when you know these people were telling you this did they say how many Linux servers they had because one of the things about that is being a collection of software parts of that are going to be GPL v3 so they've actually really already introduced it into their environment are these companies going to have their lawyers go through the license on every single package in the Linux distribution no. before they're allowing it to be no, put into their not. environment Th this uh, this particular company though I would guess six or seven figures would be the total of, of uh, pieces of Linux hardware. Um, so, um, yeah, they're clearly not doing that for every single piece yeah. of software, 
but when they're looking at adopting a major piece of software, it becomes a blocker because that's one of the checklists. If it's something that gets installed with the base install of Rail, uh, not only do they not know about it, but they probably haven't evaluated it past the first time they evaluated Rail. And, and of course, they're getting indemnification from Red Hat if they're installing Rail too, so. It's It might not, but yeah, that, but, yeah, that but as, as Spot yeah. says, it's incredibly it's risky. Yeah, it's kind of humorous in respect because you know it's like. But but it it very much reminds me of uh, of ten or fifteen years ago when people said, oh. That's GPL, that's Linux. No, must not have that, scary. Um, because it's the same type of reaction. And, and I understand that patents are scarier than copyright, but it's the same, it's almost an, un, it strikes me as an unrealistic fear. I am clearly not a lawyer, um, and I clearly don't evaluate risk for anybody other than myself. So, um, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I need. So, Spot, can you tell us what Red Hat's position on GPLv3 is? So what that means is that any time we have anything that goes into Fedora or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, we are especially careful to be aware of possible patent concerns with regards to the software that we ship. And you'll look at the stuff we ship and you'll notice that big things are missing. And I, I'm not going to go into details on that because you can Google it just as well as I can, but uh, we don't ship stuff that other distributions ship because we are a much bigger patent target. So specifically with GPLv3, uh, do you do you act do you yeah do you actively make decisions on what to contribute back into projects based upon their license? No. Okay. Interesting. No, I mean we, we don't generally contribute to non-free uh, projects. <laughs> no, no, I, but, I, I, mean, I specifically mean if you've got a GPLv3 project, do you say oh we can't do that because of no. X? No. Okay. 
So there, there's not even a process by which you evaluate. Your, your folks are free to contribute to whatever. Basically, the rule of thumb is, is it a known approved free license? If the answer is yes, go forth and have fun. OK. You should ask Spot. He is the true definition of a license key. I, I think we have another, we'd have to have another session to go through all the complexities of the patent license. What I would recommend that you do is if you go to the Free Software Foundation's page, their frequently asked questions page explaining what the patent, what they intend for the patent license to mean is very clear, it's very focused, and it's a good read. So I would just defer to that. So I will tell you. Well, again, so that's a rough question because. Yeah. Because, because what, what, what you have to, when you look at licensing or anything along these lines, you have to have some sort of case law to answer what does it mean in practice. And a lot of these cases, GPLv2 doesn't have a, any settled case law in the United States. So uh, GPLv3 definitely doesn't have any settled case law in the United States. Now, in other places around the world that have similar but not identical jurisdictions to us, namely Germany, there are some case law references on how V2 is interpreted, but again, nothing on V3. So you could get three lawyers in a room, give them each identical copies of the GPL V3, and I guarantee you each of them would give you a different interpretation on it. So, but if you combine all of their interpretations, you'll probably get something that looks a lot like what the FSF is writing on. Yeah, so, so I will tell you that no corporate counsel that I have dealt with agrees with the FSF's interpretation. And, um, well, Red Hat does, for the record, so there's at least one. Well, okay, so I've dealt with your corporate counsel. I've not dealt with them on GPLv3. Um, I think uh, to the point that we were ready to commission a study to get you know, a number of, of legal scholars and pay them money to render uh, their opinion, and hopefully they would have enough weight in, uh, in society, in the legal society for people to feel more comfortable with whatever their assessment of what GPLv3 actually said. Um, and then we were sh short-circuited by the move to, to the Apache software license. So it became a moot point then. For, but, but no, no, lawyer, no lawyer agrees with any other lawyer on anything unless there's case law, yeah, right? Unless there's a heavier than case law along with if, if, I can, if, I can point to, if I can point to a case and I can give you a site, then I can say, here is precedent and we can agree on that. And everything else is really up for interpretation. So I, I don't know that that's necessarily as dismal as you think it is, although it's still pretty dismal. The other thing to keep in mind with regards to any sort of license is if you are the copyright holder for something and you want to license it under terms like the GPLv3, for example, there's a certain amount of interpretation weight that's given to what you believe the license means. So if you read the GPLv3, you, read, you have a lawyer who talks it through with you and you come to the conclusion, this is what this means, a good piece of advice is to document that in a separate location, not to be confused with the license, like on the website, to say, the license of this is GPL v3. Now, this is what it means to me. This is what, how I interpret the patent clause, what I expect from you when you use this under these terms. It doesn't mean the world. It's not going to change existing case law, but it goes a long way if you go to trial and a judge says, well, this is what the copyright holder meant to do. This is what they were trying to achieve. So if you're in that position, I strongly recommend that you take the time to do that. Don't put it in the license because you're gonna make yourself trouble if you start putting your own interpretations of the license in the actual license, because then the license actually eats itself. But, <laughs> but, but in a separate location, say, this is what I mean by this. Yeah, so, so that gets a little more complicated when you have multiple copyright owners who are not the same entity. Um, that, that becomes a little more problematic. I have a question for you. If, if you actually change your license to, to three, are you still, like, is that software still, like, if they found, like, a weakness in two, would you still be suspect? Uh, if, if, you, if you actually change the three, like, if you 
change 100%. You're the only copyright holder and you change everything to three. It's not V2 or later, it's all three. Then you're not V2 anymore, you're V3. So anything that would happen to V2 wouldn't affect you because you were on a different license. Well, so your, your code from before that other people had under V2, they have under V2 for the rest of their times. It doesn't change that. Now you, as the copyright holder, can at any point in time say, and now the code is something else. And, and usually that applies to older licenses, older versions of code, but you're the copyright holder. They can continue to use that license under the terms they got it under originally forever. But you can pull it off your website and say, hey, now all these old versions of the code, I've gone through, relicensed them V3, they're all V3 now. It doesn't change what the guy had downloaded before, but everything from that point that somebody got new is now under those new terms. Now, to your specific point, unless the vulnerability in the V2 license is inherited by V3 because it has the same sort of text, the same sort of flaw or ruling or case law also affects V3 in a similar fashion. So only in that case would there be any concern. But simply because this one was called V2 and this one was called V3, it doesn't inherit in unless it was legitimately applicable. Yeah. Yeah, and software patents really have created a mess. I mean, uh, to the point, you know, people are trying to build, uh, build their patent portfolios if for nothing else, defensive purposes against against uh, others. So, uh, software patents are, are evil. I mean, it, it's my opinion today that you cannot write any software of any significant complexity without violating patents. You can't toast bread either without violating 15 patents that cover toasting bread. And that's, that's my opinion and not the opinion yeah. of my employer, for the record. <laughs> yes, by the way, I am not speaking for my employer if I haven't said that before. <laughs> I, I don't know that my employer has a public stance on the matter, but if they did, mine is not it. So, um, anything else we want to talk about? We are, what, 45 minutes in? So, I'm, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so I think from a business perspective, uh, there's less fear around, um, around permissive licenses because it essentially says you can do basically anything uh, with a few exceptions. Um, unlike, uh, unlike copyleft, which has this big glaring exception that that people want to expand past its boundaries. So I think there's less fear and that people equate that to less risk. Um, and I think they also equate that to less obligation. Um, and I think from a business perspective, those are the big things. Um, and I may be forgetting something, so anyone else feel free to chime in. Um, I, think, uh, I think from a contribution perspective, it doesn't feel forced. And I think that there are a certain class of people that don't like to be told that they must do something when they are doing it from their own free time. And they're happy to do what they can, but not, uh, not necessarily be told you will do X, Y, Z, or you're not in compliance with the license. Um, you know, the, the problem is, is that the, really the benefits of, of the Apache license are also the benefits from a user's perspective of the, uh, of the GPL in, in that a user and a developer can do anything that they want. And they just lose some of those potential downsides of, of uh, forced, um, forced exposure of their changes. And, uh, um, and in the specific case of V3, the patent issues. Um, so, uh, I don't know that there's necessarily a different set of pluses. I think they're, they're very, very similar, uh, especially to an end user. Um, uh, if you were, you know, I think that it's easier to perhaps get 
something standard. And so I think of when, um, when Red Hat started working with uh, their big financial partner or big financial customer to do AMQP. Um, one of the things they did was uh, started contributing heavily to an Apache licensed uh, implementation of uh, an AMQP system. Uh, they wanted that to rapidly become a standard and one of the ways to do that is make something that everyone can consume whether it's going to be proprietary or not. And in that case you care less about the software and more about the standard. Uh, and I, so I think you know, it's easier to make, uh, to make a standard stick when, when it can be more ubiquitous. Um, uh, and like I said earlier, there are obviously counterexamples like, uh, like Linux that, that show that that's not always true, but I think, it, I think it's probably less work uh, for most pieces of software if they care less about freedom and more about ubiquity. I, I certainly can. I, I'm, I'm a little scared about your statement of pragmatism. And, and here's why pragmatism scares me. Without the zealots of the world, if there were no Bradley Kuhn and, and RMS, I would be the next zealot, right? Um, because while my, while my views are pragmatic compared to theirs, which are much closer to the zealot end of the spectrum, um, if they were not setting the spectrum as being that far out, then where I am would probably be considered the, the zealot perspective. And certainly from a business perspective, I'm considered to be a zealot. Uh, and so I, think, I do think that the zealots um, push, us to, push us in the direction that we need to go, and without them, we would not, we would not have made anywhere near the progress from a way of thinking about free software and open source that we do now. Uh, so I think, I think in many ways the zealots are uh, incredibly necessary as a part of that ecosystem. Um, uh, not everyone's gonna be there and, and probably nowhere close to everyone, but uh, I, I do think that they serve a very valuable purpose. Can I, sorry. I just wanted to ask a quick question just for clarification. Um, were you saying that pragmatism is good because it allows people to release vulnerable software without people being able to see it? Or I mean, what, like I, I don't understand the 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 point for that. Okay. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs>
when you start dealing with, uh, with certain customers, you get into a, I need it now, um, I'm okay with the risk of, of it not being fully audited. Um, if you have a, copyright, a copyleft style license, you can't do it in that order. Not safer so much as um, quicker. Um, I need this product now. Uh, I'm. Well, so, so I, I've certainly seen the case where I'm, I'm, open I, I guess I'm misrepresenting what I'm trying to say, but uh, um, it's it's uh, it's very much a. Uh, you get into a chicken and an egg style problem, and, and then it, yes, in an ideal world, and, and, and that's, you would have uh, multiple eyes, you know, multiple eyes make, make bugs shallow, um, and, and that, you know, there's the, the whole open source ecosystem thrives on that, right? And uh, there's also, if you have a more permissive license, you can keep your secret sauce secret. If you're putting it in a, a kernel level thing, um, you can keep your secret sauce secret so your competitors can't take it. But then there's the things that you want to release uh, back to the community. Um, no one can tell me what to do, but I, I want to contribute back. If I'm in a copyleft license, my secret sauce is in that copyleft license as well. And so it's, it's a, a, an easy way of separating the two, is I guess what I'm trying to say. Even as some parts of your code is proprietary, you want to keep Yeah, that, that's, yeah. and that's well, just that's the. Like the commercial crisis also. I've, I've seen it with some of those with uh, highly permissive, and then because people do it so often with the permissive license, sometimes they see projects doing it erroneously with a GPL. And so they have like a big pile of detailed code, and then like five directories down is their secret sauce with a license they wrote themselves to kind of take all the Anyone else want to say something? We've got two minutes left. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 So, so your copy controls are not not exempt unless you're talking about DRM like hardware, true hardware stuff. Like you may not run, you may not run X on. On my specific hardware, even though I've this is GPL stuff, you can't make it essentially impossible to run, right? So think TiVo. Yeah. Oh, that's the TiVo clause. Yeah. Okay. But but TiVo the TiVo clause is essentially hardware DRM, right? Yeah. I mean it it's not so, it's not software DRM, but it's saying you may not run modified versions of software on this hardware. So. All right. Well, so with less than two minutes left, I will shut up. Um, I'm here all weekend, so if you want to chat about licenses, you should see Tom instead. <laughs> but, uh, if you, uh, uh, but I'm happy to talk to you about anything you wish, so thanks very much. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of, the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, 
everyone can see how Cloud Stack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary, everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of Cloud Stack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer bootcamp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. 
These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.